Hello, everyone. Hello. <clears throat> Welcome to Hauser and Worth. If you're standing in the back and we have some seats up here, you're welcome to come up here and take them. I'm Russell Salmon, Director of Public Programs and Events here at the gallery, and we're so thrilled to welcome you here in person and to those who are live streaming as well for this very special conversation between Mark Bradford and Sherilyn Eiffel. on the occasion of this incredible exhibition opening, Mark Bradford, You Don't Have to Tell Me Twice. Before we turn it over to our incredible speakers, it is my true honor to introduce one of the foremost visionaries in philanthrop philanthropy today, Ford Foundation President, Darren Walker, to introduce. Well, This is a day I have waited for. It is so easy in America today to be depressed, dejected, disgusted, and then there are occasions like this when we get to luxuriate in the brilliance of one of the greatest living artists of his generation. In this, in this beautiful, beautiful Hauser and Wirtz gallery, to see the evolution of his the arc of his career is so deeply gratifying, but this occasion is a conversation. And while they have asked me to dispense with long formal introductions, I have to say a few words. First, my dear sister, Sherilyn Eiffel. The A great warrior for justice, the seventh president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, standing on the shoulders of the great Thurgood Marshall. Cheryl and Eiffel. <clears throat> Cheryl and Eiffel is a scholar. She is an activist. She is a woman who whose DNA is steeped in the idea that every person deserves to live with dignity. And justice is not something to be rationed. And that opportunity should belong to all of us. She has lived by this creed and she is a rare patriot. Thank you, Cheryl and Eiffel for all you do for our country and the world. She is going to be in conversation with Mark Bradford. Now, what can we say about Mark Bradford that has not been written? And Mark Bradford, we know, is an artist with unique skill, talent, and capability. The accolades fill pages. Indeed, his Wikipedia is many, many, many pages I learned today. Certainly, he is one of the greatest artists collected in our greatest museums, from LACMA and the Broad all the way to the Whitney and the Metropolitan and MoMA and everything in between, it seems. The awards have just been, they're countless. Of course, he represented our country in Venice, the Biennale in 2017. 
He is the recipient of, because he is a genius, it is right that he was the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant and just about every award. But what unites these two people? Their humanity, their humility, and indeed, Sherilyn Eiffel called me a few years ago and she often, when she calls you, speaks with a sense of urgency about some great issue of injustice in the world. On this occasion, she said, she literally said, I have a dream. And you know, when Sherilyn Eiffel calls you and says, I have a dream, it's profound. And she said, my dream is that you will introduce me to Mark Bradford. And all it took was a little text, and they quickly threw me to the curb. And it has been among the many joys of my life to see the deep and abiding and enduring relationship and friendship that they have developed. So you, we are in for a treat. Please join me in welcoming Sherilyn Eiffel and Mark Bradford. So first of all, um, Thank you, Darren. Every word of that story is true. And I told you to tell Mark that I'm not crazy, that I was gonna stalk him, but let him know I'm not a lunatic. And, um, and we, did, we did end up meeting. Um, and I wanna thank you, Mark, for this opportunity to have this conversation. We've had a number of conversations, um, and I have been pushing for a while for us to do one in public. You know, because our conversations are so intense, and we just lean forward yes, a lot, and we yes. talk and talk. Yeah, yeah, and We're talking about Stacey Adams suits up there, <laughs> and we talk about things big and small, and yeah. but all I think important. Um, and I want to thank Hauser and Worth for organizing this and for inviting me to participate. Um, yeah, Stacey and, and the entire team, um, it just you know, incredible. Um, warm and supportive and and all the people who work with you your team warm and supportive and very much like you um so i want to say that and then i want to thank everybody who came out tonight because it's hot in new york and um but this is going to be fun so well, first wait, of all wait before wait, but I, but i want to thank you though I've, I've i've done some reading on you too and really i want to i mean I, but your humility and also your passion and your focus is something that I really, really admire. I knew of your work before you stalked me. <laughs> you. I did, I did. Not, not in the depth that I've gotten to know you, but I, I really did. And I want to thank you for taking the time to kind of, like, to, like we're building a bridge. And somehow I think it's almost like, it would be kind of nice because it's like we'll build a bridge and both of us will stand in the middle and we'll have yes, a conversation. Yes, and hopefully draw people from uh, yeah. both sides, I hope. Mm -hmm. It's um, a kind of a churchy sound out here. It's a lot of mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A lot of folks been I don't want to act like an usher, but there are some seats up here for right, like four or five. Usher four or five there's people right here on the, the <laughs> Yes, and usually you lift up your hand if there's an empty oh, seat there's Betty next Bryan, to you. Oh, there's Betty Bryan, honey, look, look. Come, there's come in, come in. <laughs> A look at her, <laughs> Betty's ready. Wait, wait, hold one of those seats. Hold one of those seats for her. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, Great. Ms. Brian. Oh, look, look at her. <laughs> there's one more, there's one more. I love it. I love of course, it. that's my friend. <laughs> so I also want to congratulate you, uh, Mark, on this show. Thank you. I, I don't even know how to express to you what it means to be having this talk in this room. Which um, I love. I love, yeah, I it's love crazy. having a talk with it. With yes. The art, yeah. the, when I approached the door, seeing this room the first time, you know, I got dizzy and I had goosebumps. Um, so this is a, a, an incredible privilege. And if you don't know it, 
just know that this is a privilege that we would even be sitting in this room having this conversation. And so I wanna congratulate you and your team. Um, this feels like a, another step. This is, this is another place where you've gone with this show. And, um, and that's really exciting. I didn't think you could do more, but you are growing and growing and growing and it's amazing. So the first time I saw your work um, and what made me call Darren and say, I have a dream, is that um, it was one of your mapped pieces. I think it may have been Watts or I, I don't remember, but what I saw, what I thought I saw was an exhibit for a trial that I might do, right? Because, you know, in voting rights work, we work with maps all the time. It's gerrymandering, it's districts, it's at-large voting, it's census. When I do transportation and housing um, litigation, it's about segregation and redlining. And so maps is like a huge part. And what it looked like, I wanted to put you on the stand. I said, this is an expert witness who has prepared a map that tells this story, this historical story. I felt like we were on the same team. And that's what kind of just took me there. And so the first thing, especially for people who may not have encountered in person Mark's work, um, is for you to kind of talk about data, because you don't just use maps, but your use of data and mapping as a foundation yeah. underneath your work. I mean, please talk about what draws you to that, what keeps you coming back to that mm -hmm. as the foundation and how you build on it. Well, I thought, like you talk about data and you talk about mapping, how can you enter into political spaces? I always say, how can you charge into burning houses? Because if you have a need to do it or you want to do it, how can you not get stuck? And one thing about data is you can almost use it in a counter mapping way. When you start to lay out data, it starts to tell a kind of impersonal and very personal story. So I thought, how do we talk about race and class and even gender? And mapping for me really starts to talk, mapping and remapping, it really does start to talk about ownership and power and place. And when you start to talk about a district being redistrict, that's simply power moves. And so I kind of always wanted to talk about tough subjects, but I didn't want to get this, I didn't want to be swallowed up by the subject. Does that make sense? Yes. And I didn't want it to be fully, fully abstract either. So one thing about data is it, it, it is impersonal in a way, but when you start laying it out, it starts to, it starts to make its own story. And, it's it's, a, and, it, and you can't be challenged. It is, the map is the map. The you map didn't is make the map is the map. Didn't the map. I didn't make that up. I may make what comes on top of it. It's like with the, the, the great migration and the data and the, and the travel distances. Those are the travel distances. Those are people in one place to another. And so I've, even for me, even if I'm very, very emotional and I'm looking at this data, there is something still a little bit impersonal about it where I don't, I, I don't have to get, um, I do get hung up in it, but I can step back a little bit. It's not so micro, um, and that's probably, it, 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 it could be political, and I don't wanna say impersonal, but I could step back just a little bit. But, but the, the layering that you do over the map, well, that, yeah. well just in and of itself, is a powerful political statement because maps are beneath us, right? Yes. I mean, we're, where we are right now was something else 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 400 years ago. We don't know whose land uh, we are on, right? So, so the layering is, is telling the story of what actually happens, right? It's kind of accumulation. Accumulation, history. yeah. And it's an invitation to the, to the viewer, to, 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 for the person looking at the art, to excavate. It's, I, I always feel challenged by your work. I mean, when you were showing me some of the pieces yesterday, and you said, don't you see over here? This is, <laughs> this is a train sketch. You know, and I would say, what? You know, I haven't even seen it. It's very challenging. And that is, in fact, the way we have to approach complicated issues like race. Mm -hmm. and class and yeah. gender is that it's it's complex and it's deep and it's multi-layered and what we think we see is not the whole story right so that feels powerful and political well, just that act well and so, i mean if you you're you, I mean, you're exactly right i mean it, how do you grapple with such large complicated 
deep, literally deep, and not just figurative, figuratively deep. It's sort of like how do you, how does a developer want to build a building, and they find that that's a an, that's an old um, burial ground for slaves. Now we got this layer, and like, how do we complicate? Like I always say that, like you, Rome, you 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 unearth one Rome to find another Rome on top of it, on top of it, on top of it, on top of it, and I think that these these heavy, deep excavated issues that we're kind of dealing with in this country in some ways. You, you know more than me. Um, we can talk about that. But I, I find my, I think I've created a kind of a, an artistic way to grapple with these things personally and politically. I create my own excavations. And I kind of know that they're still based on this kind of ground. There's a ground under. Is there perspective in this as well? I mean, obviously you're very tall. I so, <laughs> so, 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 all am I? It's in some ways like the work reflects you, right? You would, you know, I mean, I remember coming into your studio and seeing you kind of next to pieces that were in progress. Yeah. And I felt like, yeah, these fit together. You know, he's tall, the pieces are huge. Um, and I just wonder whether the perspective isn't part of it too. Like if you, you know, when you're close to something, you see certain things, and then when you're far away, you see yeah. certain things. When you're low on the ground, you see certain things. When you're higher up, you see certain things. Mm -hmm. So I always think about your height being part of kind of being able to see the whole thing, being able to see the whole map. It's just a way of thinking about like how we see our world, which is, you know, sometimes we're from very close to it. But yes, from our own little, but like actually there's another story that is when we pull back a little bit, like how people watch your Paintings. We talked about that. Yeah. Sometimes we, I'm sure you all have experienced it. You walk up close because you can't believe it, and you want to know how does he do it, right? And then you find that you have to walk back. Oh, well, I like the macro and the micro. I yeah. like very intense conversations up close. Yeah. Girl, this and girl that, and then I like kind of you know far 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 back. Um, I always I like big novels. I like to fall into things. I like to take time. Short stories. I'm like, oh man, really? We're done. Over. It's oh, over. God. It's sad, you know. And Rebecca and yeah, those big. Yeah. I need a big old. And also, I'm a fixer. I like to fix things, but I like to fix big problems, big paintings. Big. So it takes me a while to kind of grapple with the the, the information that I've I've laid bare. So it's really a way for me to slow down. I just like to slow, I'm always kind of slowing my doubt, myself down, figuring out ways to slow. So like that painting, it, it's gonna take a little, it's gonna take a minute to well, get, across the, get across the canvas. I always say you gotta get across the canvas. You just gotta get across you work, it. Do you work that way in a direction? Mm, up and down and horizontal, vertical, from no top words, to no. <laughs> I don't know, no. Oh Lord, oh Lord. I. Uh, well, so listen, when Mark and I were, um, were inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on the same day, and I was giving the class speech, so I was on the stage and Mark was in the audience. <laughs> Mark texted me from the audience that, that he um, gasped on the inside when he saw that I had brought my purse with me. Now, I just handed my purse to my daughter. I am never- I was surprised. <laughs> I was surprised. Yeah, I was, yeah. and that's a small one for me. So I used to have a big purse, and so I had it up on the stage, literally next to my chair. And he's laughing and texting me from the audience about my purse, and he said, "I understand. You never know when you have to go." That's true. Right. <laughs> you never know when you got to get out. <laughs> when you got to get out, and yep. I do feel that way. I feel like I yep. need to be prepared. Yep. And so when you then um, made a <laughs> contribution to the Great Migration exhibit at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. Um, of that, of this extraordinary work, Blackdom, yeah. it got me thinking about like that sense of you gotta go and you know, the great migration and how much black people have had to identify the moment. Yeah, you don't have to tell me twice, you know. You don't have to tell me twice. I'm a, you know, that, how many different ways, you know how many different ways I've been saying it? You don't have to tell me twice. Yeah, I, I said, or you don't have to tell me twice. Or you, you don't have to tell me twice. You don't have to tell, oh, that's a good one. That's, that's a good you one. Know. You, you don't have to Don't tell wait, wait for the that's, pause. That's or the, yeah, the little young ones. I think that that's what they do. Yeah, now you that's tell me one. twice. Period. <laughs> I think that's the updated version of you don't have to tell me twice. Or say less. That's what my daughter told me. Say less. I love oh, that. Oh, say less. Mm -hmm. 
But I, you know what I love about language, and especially the way in which black people use language, I think because so much, we were always on the move or always under threat. So it, the physicality of the language, I've always loved. I always love when it, there's a slight change in it, but the physicality in the body is the same. I don't know when we started catching flies. The girls started catching, I don't know when that started. And just one day, they were just, you know, the little hands and the little... Oh, and when my child does it to me, when she either, one of two things, the snatching, or this is to me the most insolent, the counting. I have, my oldest daughter will say, first of all, first of all... No, I don't have that one. Oh my God, <laughs> you gonna count it out? What is going on? But listen, let me take you back to the Great Migration. Yeah. I really want you to, because it's not in this exhibit, but it is in this exhibit, yeah. because there's progression here to um, share with people what blackdom is, um, which I had never heard yeah. of before I saw your extraordinary piece at the BMA. Um, blackdom was a, a, a small black township founded in um, Blackdom, New Mexico, around 1900 maybe. And it was basically, it, there were a lot of black townships, people li leaving the South and moving to places and getting land from the government or from Johnny. To, to you know to, come to Johnny we to, come. To, to develop and um, I found the ad in the back of crisis magazine 500 Negro families to settle Blackdom New Mexico and there was something about the idea of hope and moving from one sp space that wasn't safe to a space of possibility and imagination that's actually where this room came out of was the ideas of imagination and space sight and non-sight because I was very I'm very good at like having stories that go on in my mind that have literally nothing to do with what's going on around me. I think I learned that from my partner. Who's, he's a, he'll have a whole like idea going around. I'm like, Alan, what, literally, what, what? I just watch him and he's acting out a whole play. Um, and um, so. But, 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 but so Blackdom the shows. The flight. The, yeah, the, so Blackdom shows the, shows the ad. The ad, actually. I, I call it a merchant poster. A, a, literally like a merchant poster. And there was something that resonated with me. I mean, it, it's something that, I mean, you can think of the, the, the people coming through Ellis Island or people coming through, um, as people, as we're, they're migrating right now, as they're getting in boats, as they're coming to uh, Tijuana, the U.S. border. So there's just something that resonated, even in my own idea, the idea of, then I, it's funny, we we're talking about the, these ideas of big macro migrations, but then when I started thinking about my own migration and my own body and having to move through spaces when I started going through puberty, that just weren't as safe, really just weren't as safe. I didn't really mind being called some of the names I was called, but I knew that there was gonna be a physical action that could be connected with And you're me. talking about homophobic violence in particular. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, called a punk and you know punk stuff. And I thought, well, um, I, I better move my body from here to there because that's not safe. And eventually to Europe. As yeah, I did. I did. I did move. My, so this idea of migration and uh, was something that's been uh, safety really. That but the migration to Europe really came out of AIDS, AIDS epidemic, and being so young and thinking, well, I better make some moves until it all works out. So it, I think my personal migration kind of started to, again, lay on top of that idea of the, of the larger. And maybe that's really what I wanted. Maybe I wanted to kind of have a relationship between macro ideas and micro ideas, kind of be, be, between the two. Well, what was fascinating for me in reading the story of Blackdom, and, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, um, you know, it, it came to naught, right? It didn't, it didn't you know, these people left with the dream that they were going to go to this place in New Mexico and start over. And I think the ad even said something like, no Jim Crow there or... Right, no right, Jim Crow, right. You know, so it was really promising something um, that, you know, people had not seen. And, um, and we were teasing because I would say, well, I would have gone. And, and I was said, like, oh, no, I got a good job. Yeah. <laughs> we, we talked about being very different people. He would he would have, he would have just tried it out. And I, oh, absolutely. Let's no. And I would, no. I would have had, come on, girl, let's get let's do this. What kind of jobs they got down there? We, we'll, we'll, we'll open our own spot. Is it Mexico or New <laughs> Mexico? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'd had a million wait, excuses. Wait, wait, you're asking too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> too many questions? I have a good job right here. You know, I wouldn't have been able to go. W-2s meet the 1099s. That's it. We talked about this yesterday. You know, I said, I will move anywhere 
if I had a job, a house, some car, health insurance, some health insurance, for sure. Absolutely. Uh uh. No. And we were talking about my parents were immigrants, you know, and I, I'm talking about the peculiar people who move, you know, who who take the chance. But it is about imagination. And, and it is all and it's about the urgency of the place you are in Absolutely. being so dangerous. Um, and which is why, you know, the, the whole reaction to immigration is so appalling to me, because, right. you know, if your life was great, what do you think it takes for someone to walk through the Darien Strait with their child to come to a place they've never seen? Absolutely. On, on, a, on a hope, you know, so it has to be so appalling where you are from. But there also has to be an amount, you have to kind of suspend disbelief. And that's in this room because you shared with me what some of these are, because mm -hmm. um, we were thinking about blackdom. And I was saying, is it Mexico or New Mexico? Because I was saying, I'd never heard of New Mexico probably, and I wouldn't even know what it might look like. And of course, it was dry, and the, the town eventually failed for lack of water. Um, but it was, you know, it was not prime land at no, that point. No. But, but tell us about the, what you've portrayed. Well, you know, I, I kind of did some research and I found that there were jaguars and there were birds and there were animals and, and I just kind of made it up in my own phantasmagorical way. And by the way, I'm not that guy who's, who's walking out in nature. I'm not that person. <laughs> so let me just like preface it by, dispel, I, that. dispel all that. I'm not the person that goes out and gets Zen and walks with no paths to just walk. I'm just gonna walk. And I see people doing that when I'm driving in the car. I'm like, what are they doing? <laughs> and why? That's, a, that's not me. Alan knows. Um, but, I, but, but I have a real good, I have a ma imagination. So I started to project in a, in a kind of a childlike way, what it could be, the hope of something that you don't know. I remember when I used to do a lot of traveling um, and I would come back to the hair salon and, and some of the clients would love when I got back and they'd say, so tell me how it is out there. And you would have to use imagination and you'd have to weave it in a way that they conjure stories and that was really fun. They're like, Mark, I'm not trying to hear about the Eiffel Tower. Tell me about the clubs and the men in Paris. <laughs> so you would have to kind of edit it for your audience, you know? So. Um, okay, so here, here come the Christian person. Let me not talk about the getting drunk and got it. You got to know your audience, right? So, so, so this really came out of an imagination and came out of thinking about hope, and and came out of memory. And that's another big thing that I'm always interested in is memory. Um, how do we grapple with historical memory of 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 sight, and then how do we push it forward? That was something that I was really thinking about. And also, it was very difficult to make a body of work in the last three years, because, you know, America's just not cute. It's just not cute. So how do you? Well, it never was cute. So that's what's nice about the excavation in the portraits, which is that it's not cute all the way down. You know, All the way down, it's not cute. We were talking <laughs> you know? about that earlier. Yeah. You were saying, that, can you talk about digging out roots? <laughs> Well, we were talking about what, what is the moment that was- Because I asked her upstairs. Yeah, what, what's the moment we're in in this country and you know, how do we get here? And you know, and I, was, I was saying that the moment is um, a, a moment, an inevitable moment that comes from the failure to um, honestly confront um, our truths and particularly our truths around racism and white supremacy and, um, and all that goes with it, which is patriarchy and all the other pieces. And, um, and the belief that you could just appease that or tell yourself it's down there in the South um, and, and not confront it. When in fact it is a poison, it is a cancer. You know, you wouldn't have cancer in your foot and be like, it's down in my foot, I'm fine, right? You wouldn't, but we do. And so now that it has metastasized mm. and um, is actually killing the host, <laughs> you know, and the, and the house is falling in around us, we keep saying, how did we get here? And some people want to fool themselves into believing that it's this one crazy man from New York who, who, who did this. Um, but the truth is somebody cannot walk up into your democracy and just snatch it unless it's weak, un unless it already has its own vulnerabilities. And, um, and so we're being confronted with that. And the whole world sees it. That's why Russia could be, you know, in 2016 using the internet to you know, gin up racial conflict and everything. I mean, it's like when everybody knows your business in the neighborhood. Everybody in the world knows that our Achilles heel is racism. 
Yes. And so it can be manipulated and it can be, and that's the, and so it's, it's never been cute. And that's supposed, that should actually relax us because the feeling of we're in a moment that is beyond what we've ever seen. You know, I think sometimes with the civil rights movement, we're so, you know, as a kid, I wanted to become a civil rights lawyer because every video, every documentary seemed amazing. These noble people, the marches, facing the dogs, the burning and the, you know, and, and I still believe that. I, I, you know, I know many of those people and they are among the most noble I have ever met. But it wasn't fun. You know, I was like, oh, I want to be part of that. <laughs> you know, it was not fun. There was a lot of pain. Um, and so I think we've, we've in, in, in taking that story, the story of the civil rights movement and making it palatable for mainstream America, we've kind of left behind, you know, I think about 1963, we're in 2023, you know, 1963 was like, I mean, yesterday, you know, the anniversary of Martin Luther King getting arrested in Alabama, which is how he was able to write the letter from a Birmingham jail, because he was in the Birmingham jail, right? Medgar Evers assassinated on, you know, on his, on his doorstep. Um, there was so much that was happening that was painful, but what we talk about is, oh, the 50th anniversary or the 60th of the March on Washington. No, pain. So what we're living with now is a continuation of that, but it's so bad and so unraveling that we're being compelled to confront this truth, and so that's what feels so bad, but kind of secretly is the good part. Oh yeah, right. It's like in our bodies, we have the we we have the memory of it. Yes, it's there. It's the, it's in our it's in our communities. When I started writing about lynching, that was yeah. what you know um, pushed me to do it. It's hiding in plain sight. Yes, yes. And that's why the mapping piece mm -hmm. I love so much. Lincoln Center is doing a whole program right now on San Juan Hill. Um, which is, you know, the area of Lincoln Center and what that neighborhood was like. We all love watching West Side Story, you know, the Jets and the Sharks and everything. Well, that's where they were living, you know, until they knocked it down for Lincoln Center. Just knowing the place where you stand and knowing what that history is. But is part sometimes, of it. do you feel like um, when when it becomes romantic, that uh, that you that people will kind of bristle if you try to keep it messy and show the kind of messiness of it instead of this kind of these rom these big, large, macro romantic narratives. Oh, I think so, I yeah. think so. When I was, um, um, so I stepped down last year from leading the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. When I was preparing to take over the job in 2022, um, I was very clear about what needed to be done, but also terrified, right? Because now you're gonna be a civil rights leader and people expect you to have answers. And I went to a program one night and um, the great civil rights historian Taylor Branch was on stage with somebody else, was actually in Baltimore. And he had said something I've never forgotten. He said, civil rights leaders in um, the late 1950s and early 1960s were perpetually anxious about what to do next. And I thought, fantastic, <laughs> you know, you don't have to know, you don't have to figure the, the whole thing out. And those people that we like to see, it wasn't because they knew everything, you know, it was messy. They, were, they tried some things and some things didn't work, you know. Um, you know, the Albany campaign of Martin Luther King or when he went to Chicago and was kind of like horrified by the violent response, like some things didn't work out. The Memphis strike, you know, sanitation strike, you know, and uh, where he was killed. Um, it was it was a very low time. And so, yes, people do try to pull you back to the fairy tale. The fairy tale, the, 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 the beauty of the story is in the resilience. Yes. OK. Not in like it yeah. was all great. But you're human. But you're human, yeah. you work through it, it was painful, some people had breakdowns, some people had to check out, like that's all part of the story too, you know? But that's not what people want to hear from you. Well, or any of us. Yeah. I mean, if you start talking about the Great Migration, people are gonna say, oh yes, you know, and we had our well, sandwiches in the hamper, and the, you know what I mean? And we're gonna tell the part of it that feels, but it was painful. Yeah, I, I get that, yeah. So when you created this beautiful thing here, you know, that this one, um, with the Jaguar and the colors and everything, I thought it was so powerful because at the end of the day, however, imagination does have to sustain you, right? Well, yes, I mean, it, it, I have to grapple with whatever I'm grapple with, grappling with. And sometimes what I'm grappling with is not always evident on the surface. It's maybe the, the, it's the prompts that I have within myself, but at the end of the day, I do have to step back and let it be what it is, which is the painting. 
And I kind of have to um, accept that in a way because some people may not get the references. Some will. Um, it's like me using um, Faulkner. I don't. I mean, I, Faulkner points to a very particular place, a troubling place, a really messy place, place and un uncomfortable, really. But he was a witness to something that I was interested in, and so. A couple paintings here that are reference to a, a Faulkner, Faulkner story, and you can look it up later. And I know that Hauser and Worth has a um, very immersive website now that allows you to do more research on the show. So if you haven't seen it or you want to learn more, you can learn more. But I was surprised to see this Faulkner. I actually didn't know the story. The story is Sanctuary. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you said those, these prompts happen for you, and then... Yeah, well... I, 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 I've, always, I've always been interested in the world around me, and I've always wanted my work to come out of that, but yet I also wanted to have the, lu the not luxury, but I made the decision to be able to pull it into my studio and grapple with it privately. Mm. Everybody don't need to know all my business. Right. You know. Right. But, and, 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 and so when I'm, when I'm grappling with it, I'm wondering how much of the social I can, or the political, or the race that, that I choose, and it's really like a back and forth thing. Sometimes I'll make a work and I think it's showing too much and I'll pull it back a little bit. Only time when I, I wish I, I don't pull back when I'm talking. Yeah. I probably should, but I. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> it I, you know, I share, whatever. But in the work, it's kind of, um, it's that back and forth of how much to reveal and how much to hide. Or, I, I know you're, you're, but you're setting your own boundaries with your art. I think that's right. Because some, uh, some conversations you don't necessarily want to get drawn into with the piece, you know? That's true. Right? Yeah, that is true. Because actually, the, the, the map of blackdom I had taken out of the show. But then when I put the sculptural elements, which really personalized the, the migration, mm -hmm. then I was able to put the map in because I didn't want it to, to be a spokesman for a large, big idea right. of the huge mm -hmm. migration yes. of migration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's always that back and so, forth. So I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the process because it's not possible to look at one of Mark's pieces and not wonder and marvel, especially when you come to realize what lies beneath, how you do what you do. And I asked you, I mean, I'll just give an example. This piece right here, which is, is this fire, fire? Is this, yeah, yeah. yeah. So a lot of the Blackdom piece, which we've been talking about, looks like the, the part that's kind of dark and yellow, which looks like it's burned. And I just was so curious about how you did it. So maybe just starting there, like with just giving an example that everybody in this room can see, how did you create that sense of fire? What's it made of and how did you create it? I just put an emotion on some paper and drag it out into the sun. I hate when, he's, I hate when he does I mean, this. I, I hate mean, what do you want me to say? It you know, I'm, it I'm telling you the truth, you know. Come on. I do. How did you know that that was going to create that? I did, did you know? Well, you've been working, you know, you've been working the same block for 25 years, you know a few things. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You're not an ingenue. <laughs> I'm like, I kind of, you know, I kind of know. Well, let, let me just talk about paper. Um, I like to limit my scope. It's like, I like improvisational jazz. I like, I like to have improvisation with a structure around it. So I've been using this material for a very long time and I'll probably continue to use it. I am fascinated by paper because it's both the most precious thing in the world and it's the most common thing in the world and you decide. Um, all of our historical documents are on paper. So I do like that, but then I also like the fact that it's unforgiving and it's not naturally unless you use tissue paper translucent. If there's an opaqueness, you almost have to beat it into revealing what's underneath, which is probably me too, right? I mean, this layer upon layer. So I do like that. And also I do like the idea of alchemy. When you put it in water, it becomes liquid. So you're, it's almost like liquid paper. It, it becomes liquid. And I like the struggle. I do like the struggle. And I like the idea that it can fall completely apart and be. It, it'll just look like, wallpaper, you know, dead. It'll just be dead. So that idea that something is at the border of something being transparent or being opaque, concrete, and death, and or breathing some life into it. It's all the things that I do with my team in the studio. And I, why, yeah, why do I like paper? I'm, 
I'm not going to it's it's not you said you started with the end papers in your mom's salon, I right? I did. I was comfortable. And actually, you know, the funny thing is end papers are tissue paper. They're very translucent. And I man, I I got so much mileage out of those translucent papers. I thought I was a <laughs> genius. You, know, you would layer them and layer them and it was all translucent yeah, and yeah. wonderful. Then I went to like copy paper and that was like concrete. <laughs> now what? So it's interesting. I'm always creating. I'm always creating. I've always worked myself into a corner, and then I have to invent something to get out. I'm always. I'm always thinking of how we're gonna. How we're gonna make this work? Turn something over. How, turn something over. <laughs> turn something over. She was telling me that's what a saying her father used to say, yes, and I yes. love that. When you, when you have no money, that was his thing. He had to just go out and try to turn something over. We didn't know what that meant. <laughs> It's none of our business, <laughs> but turn something turn over. something over because he was a 1099. Well, he was originally a 1099. See, see, here's the thing. And he was you're right. He was original. Well, first of all, if you're an immigrant, you're a 1099. Oh, honey, you're <laughs> a 1099. You were, that's right. You were. <laughs> so he was trying to turn something over, but then we did switch to that W two, and I, I'm a you know, and I'm a W two girl because I got to have some secure some security security around me. I gotta have it. I'm second generation 1099, so it got third generation. <laughs> so we really turn swing it. without a net. But you know, but you know, but can I tell you something? You turned something over. Yeah, I did turn <laughs> something over, right? <laughs> now this feels like the perfect segue to talk about Johnny. Johnny Bison. When you when you enter the first piece that you saw in that first room. Johnny buys houses. And, um, and many of you know that Mark works a lot with merchant posters. And those of us who are, you know, kind of from the inner city or what are used to seeing these are usually on fences or gates telephone or at intersections, poles. telephone poles. Yeah. You know, they're going to buy your house for cash or. Um, I'll buy. I'll, we'll I'll buy. buy. We'll buy. And, uh, you know, or they're selling certain things, payday loans and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. This one that feels different, maybe because of the name. Yeah, this is one of the few that I saw that was personal. I said, finally, I know who it is. It's Johnny. Who's ripping, who's ripping me off? <laughs> Johnny, I knew it was somebody. Johnny, you know, so Johnny became this like specter, this ghost, this bully through the whole show. I just put Johnny became the, the whole kind of support of the show. And what's so troubling and so uncomfortable is the, 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 the merchant posters are usually at site level and they're usually with people either t walking or taking public transportation, not for people in cars. Those are above your head or on your phone. And so with the crash of the housing market and all you see now in the kind of uh, South Central is only basically 90% will buy your house. Buy house, 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 house. And, that, and, and they stack. We were talking about this kind of layering. And it's interesting. One will put one, and then one will go higher on the telephone pole and higher. And it all. No, me. No. It, 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 all the way up, and you'll look, and it'll be way up. It'll almost be like this tower of Babel that kind of goes up. I love, um, I do like taking them down, though. Do you do this? Oh, I do take them down. Oh, I don't nice. go all the time and take yeah. them down, but when we're driving down the street and we see one that we have, I, I'm, re you know, uh, I'm really like a, w what is it when you make maps? What's the word? Cartographer. I'm kind of like a hood cartographer. <laughs> you know, I go and, I, and then I like, oh, I have look at that. that. Yeah. Pull over. <laughs> What you said, I'd love to go down a street and remember what was there. Yeah. But then I, re I was talking to someone and they were saying that they like to re do that as well. But then I remembered, I'm only good at remembering the clubs. Say like, <laughs> like nightclubs. Yeah, no, I know what you meant. Yeah. You know, nightclubs. <laughs> You know where people go I when know, they didn't go to the library? I totally got it. I used to go to the library <laughs> well, I know you every did. Saturday. Right, and I went to the club every Saturday. But you know what they're doing now? They, they're closing the library and keep the club open. <laughs> hey, you fit in where you fit in. <laughs> but um, I always have been fascinated by that. I've always been fascinated by the memory of a of, of place yeah. and then the erasure of place. And does, does, it, does it still hold in the land? in some way, or is it completely erased? I think all the levels still in some way inhabit it in some way. Mm -hmm. I was in a house that was owned by this like famous promoter 
And although, although he wasn't there, I, in my mind, conjured that he was there. So I, I, I do like that. But um, Johnny really pointed to something and personalized it. It reminded me of when we didn't have a name for AIDS. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, they said, okay, we have a name mm -hmm. for it. It's like I felt like I had a name for the boogeyman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and there was some, there's something creepy about the, it being... It, Johnny, There's so, you know, because you're right, it does sound like the boogeyman, but it's also like a very familiar name, you know. Oh, absolutely. They, that's a marketing thing. It's, yeah. it, well, it's a marketing thing, right? Yes. It's Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream, Famous Amos Cookies. Like, you you know, the name makes you feel more, and, and that, so that's part of the True. predation, yeah. right? Johnny buys houses, which is supposed to make you feel more comfortable about the fact that this predator is going to rip you off and take the one thing that you have that, yeah. that you really need if you want to if you want to make it. And so there's something about it it, and you know, it's a lot of it is white, um, camouflaged. Yeah, yeah. And it's something about it, so it it feels really creepy, even though that's like a, the brightest piece when you walk in. Yeah. So um, the, I, well, I'm all well, Johnny, you know, and, it, and that becomes a, you're right, a metaphor for predation. Exactly, because isn't it always camouflaged? Yes. You always say, oh, I didn't see that coming. Well, they didn't want you to see that coming. Mm. You know, <clears throat> I can remember an early, early AIDS ep epidemic. And I was uh, 1981 or 1980. I was right there at the time. And I remember the, the kind of conversations around, it was so, mid something's going to get in you and hide out. And then it's going to pop out. It, this, it almost felt like, yeah, it was. A, it was made a, it, it even was, scarier. It was mm -hmm. camouflaging somewhere in you. Mm -hmm. You didn't know where it was going to come mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. and get you, mm -hmm. but it was going to. The AIDS was going to get you, Oof. and that was something. It was so strange because that's the way that they would just, you know, mm -hmm. the AIDS got you, mm -hmm. you know, and the the, the. Mm -hmm. the AIDS. And I thought, well, wait a minute, now there's things you can do. <laughs> So that, I, it, it, and, 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 and in such a young mind, you make it, um, you make it physical. You make the boogeyman a physical th yeah. thing. Yeah. Like children. That's a are, terror. That's a terror. Of what's inside the closet. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you can't convince some children that there's nothing inside yeah. that closet. And there could be for that child yes. something in that closet. Indeed. So um, how imagination collapses into terror and camouflage and, and in plain sight. Yes, and you put Johnny as a jaguar, right, in, in, in one of these pieces as a way of kind of describing that predation and that, um, that viciousness and, that, and, and what can be the tearing and the, you know. And um, it, it, to me, that's a story that you, um, you have to spend a minute to, f to feel that story from, from those works, and that's pretty powerful, too. That's part of the excavation, and sometimes you're not ready for the whole story. So it's actually good to spend some time to kind of help yourself understand the way predation works, particularly in this country. Um, and that's why the Johnny piece ap appeals to me, saying something that sounds very friendly. Johnny sounds like he lives around the way. Um, but in fact, this is part of a network of people that are you know, designed to, to take away from you this thing that you need so desperately. So it's incredibly powerful piece. Now, I gotta get to the second floor. I want to talk a little bit about drama, and you have a film on the second floor mm -hmm. that some people may not have seen. The film is you. Um, it's you in 1973, and I think you said you took this film with your friends with the I did. Super Eight. Yep, people that we you know we lived in an apartment building. It was two or three little friends that we always would kind of hang out together. They were kind of strange, and we were kind of strange, and we'd just be strange together inside <laughs> the apartment building because outside wasn't working out so well. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I got. I think it was 1973 and 1974. I, it was definitely the black exploitation mm -hmm. time. Everybody had afros, platform shoes, and the whole okay. thing. But then I saw Pam Greer. Coffee. Foxy Baby. Brown. And I said, now, wait a minute now. This, <laughs> wait a minute. Did she just shoot the man? Did she? Well, she just shot the white man and the black man <laughs> and took it, everything from both of them and drove away in her Corvette. I thought, no, wait a minute, something's <laughs> bubbling here. And what I understand was I was identifying less with Shaft and more with Cleopatra Jones. Cleopatra Jones. And Cleopatra Jones was tall. She you was tall. She was. She was. She was. Yeah. And there was something called the Cleo coat. Yes, Tamara it, Dobson was the actress's name. It was name. Out of, made yeah. out of rabbit. Yes. Remember them rabbit yes, coats? It was like a Lord. Vest. Wasn't it like a vest? Yes, yes. honey, them rabbit coats with all that rabbit fur everywhere on your couches and everywhere, it was a mess. But 
Um, and so it was, and, and so I started making my own. I made my own Cleopatra Jones, my own Foxy Brown, my own coffee, my own Wonder Woman. And um, it was, it was, we were all, it was me and, and they were all, all girls. They were all girls because they were just friendlier. I mean, they would say, I, like I always say, you, 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 you get in where you fit in. Mm -hmm. I don't ever beg people to like me nor love me. Mm -hmm. I go to the people that just do. Mm -hmm. I ain't going to beg nobody. There I've we always go. There we go. No, 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 so I'm not going to do that because that's. That doesn't. That and you knew that even then, as a very young. Yeah, because it because I knew I, I intuitively felt I had a long way to go, mm -hmm. and I wasn't worried about the lunchroom or the table, uh, the, the the tables that didn't want me to sit in at, at the table, the cafeteria. I was looking for the one that wanted me to sit there. <laughs> then I was going over there. I was going over there. I was hmm, walking right by the ones that didn't. You know. No, really, you've got to it. fix yourself. I love that's it. really that's important. Good. That's, that's really, really important good. to understand. We talked about this I yesterday. Mean, I, had, yeah. I, had, I had survival mm -hmm. early because I kind of could tell that maybe I wasn't going to be wanted everywhere, mm -hmm. which wasn't really wasn't any of my business. So um, so we, I started making them, and um, I kept, I didn't really keep them. I, somehow I kept them, and then they were part of my archive. I, I'd forgotten about them. I can't and believe then, it. I can't And then my it. assistant oh. reminded me, and, and I don't know. I never really put myself in the work, but at this moment in history, I felt like I wanted to have an intimate, up close conversation with people and also these macro. I wanted to go back and forth. And um, I love it. I love it. It's like 20 seconds, but it's, you know, and it's and it's got the death drop kind of, but it's also got the rebirth. Oh, that was important. Yeah. Now, the little kid couldn't just fall down. No. no he had to no, kind of wiggle important. himself back up the wall. <laughs> Listen, so you two had this kind of dramatic, because we were very, we had these oh, yeah. you know, dramatic, we did skits. Uh-huh. And then, uh, you know, we did a lot of Barbie doll fighting. There was a lot of fighting oh, over yeah. Ken. There was racial strife between Stacy and Barbie and Chrissy and Julia. Gender issues. Yeah, no, it was, yeah. yeah, there was a lot of that happening just in the room, you know, mm -hmm. doing that kind of stuff. Because we didn't have really the... That's right. The, 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 we didn't go nowhere, so we had to kind of make... Mm -hmm. so, so, but that fall and then the getting back up is just beautiful and just watching it on the loop. And but, also the beauty of you. I'm going to embarrass you. The beauty of you as just a young black man, just there you are. With hair. With hair. <laughs> Um, you know, I was going. That, I was going through puberty. That I was probably already six feet. Yeah. And um, dealing with a body that everybody wanted to name. Mm -hmm. And um, I. He had to get back up. Yes. I mean, he had to get back up. I, um, but the funny thing is, I didn't have. I had a Super 8 camera, but it didn't have a slow motion on it. So uh, I was acting it out slowly. So you're doing. Um, you're doing. <laughs> You getting it? Are you getting it? Are you getting it? <laughs> I mean, here we slow down. But also the screen. <laughs> and there actually is someone off. It's, it's another a director. There's a director, yeah, of course. We kind of were director, sound people, costume, yes. and all at the same time. Yes, yes, yes. And she was holding the gun. So <laughs> off the other cut, when the camera just it was like. <laughs> She's holding the gun, but I didn't want to put her body in. It wasn't no, about her. No, and this is a very I want to hear her call me next week. <laughs> you know my hair wasn't right. <laughs> um, so, um, but that, but again, I was just playing out of my imagination, trying to develop safe spaces for me to keep being me. I will always acknowledge, as I will always understand the 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 the, the, the stereotypes and the ob objectification. Objectification. Yeah. Oh wow! I almost had it. You did. Almost. Which is and um, just the emphasis. Yeah. Just the mm, was wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, I always have always acknowledged them, but I won't internalize it. When I get caught up in that, I just try to get out of it as fast as I can. Mm, that's powerful. I re I just try. Oh, I got caught up in some mess. Let me get out of it. I'm not what they think I am. This is not me. And I move through again. This kind of moving through spaces. Um, and so that came out of that and it's interesting to see when so i the that, so the companion though yeah. is on the fifth floor yeah and it's you again it's me mm -hmm. although 
I do think that the thigh was a little Wait thick a minute now. That's my a, thigh. It looks a little thick. But anyway. Look, so look like I got a long ankle that goes all the way attached. <laughs> it's true. That's true. That's true. But it's you. It's you. Yeah. And you're doing the, you know, the death drop. Yeah. And I actually want to want to understand more how you see the relationship between the two death drops. Death drop ni 1973. Whatever it actually sounds like a movie, like Shaft's Big Score. It really... Death it really drop, sounds, 1973. Death drop, 1973. That's not bad. Mm. We could work. You know how it'll be like Blackula and then scream Blackula scream and then, you know, right? Ooh, yes, Lord. <laughs> I never could understand Blackula. I was like, that don't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> what you want to be called? I liked it. Not Blackula. I mean, come on. Really? We can't do, I don't know, something. So you want a different name. Well, his name was Mama Waldy, if you've seen. Anyway, so here's the thing. <laughs> so, so what I want to understand is the relationship between Death Drop 1973, you know, you as this young kid doing this mm -hmm. thing, and then Death Drop 2023, which is actually incredibly beautiful and powerful, and I would love if you also talked a little bit about how you made that, because yeah. it well, sits it, in the middle of the room and it Well, Death Drop way. belongs to ballroom culture, you know, and, and that belongs to kind of queer spaces, and but also he's wearing a jacket, which means that he's not in a safe space, he's outside where, in the environment where things could happen both good and bad. And it really is, again, me laying another history on these kind of larger narratives around great migrations or something like that. And I was really, when I was making the paintings, I was thinking about migrations, plural. I started thinking about Bayard Rustin. Yes. People who kind of were starting to know him. Does anybody know who Bayard Rustin is? They, you do, civil rights leader, probably the best organizer of the civil rights movement. He was gay and, and had been arrested a number of times. Actually, I think they just pardoned him in some place where he had been arrested. And, and there was a lot of anxiety within the civil rights movement about the fact that he was gay, which is why many people have not, don't know his name as well as they know other people because they didn't want to put him front and center. Um, and, and, but Martin Luther King really relied on him. He was the organizer of so much of what you saw in the civil rights movement, but go ahead. And that, and I wanted to kind of lay that history on top of it to kind of just, just again, another layer just another layer and maybe more personal. I just wanted to lay that. So putting my, I started to think about my migration and, 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 and how there could be a relationship between both. I mean, I am both black and queer in the same body almost at the same time. So generally all the time, unless I'm schizophrenic and start talking. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to have those, that layering, and I wanted to have that complexity that goes on all the time, and now we're, we're constantly moving through these different, in our own internalness. And so I thought that, um, I wanted to have the, that conversation. I, did, I, would, I didn't want it to be this kind of heroic, big gesture. I wanted it to be both large and small and kind of complex and not looking for an answer, just kind of, putting them together. It's, I just kind of wanted to put them together. And um, really, it's just me, Scanned, and, and Sean, and my other assistant, is real like tech genius, and he knows. So I kind of nod my head, because I try to be cool like I understand it, but I don't understand any of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, scan data, right. And oh, yeah, and then we're going to 3D model it, right. And I have no idea. All I do is I laid on the floor for two hours. I got up off the floor and took a bunch of Tylenol because I was so sore. And then I, it went away. It came back in its very dense foam. And then I went and I started doing what I do. I laid there and I started to play with it and I would talk to it sometime. And I liked, I don't know why, I got, I got in this thing where it was always on the floor and I would like hit him on the, wake up, wake up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I enjoyed it, but I have to admit, when I got here, it was not what it looks like now. Um, and Johnny was not what it looks like now. Um, my, my team told me that I was being too delicate and I was being afraid and you just need to stop and finish these works. Because I, I kind of, they got, they got precious. You know, they were in Hauser and Worth now, you know. And they were coming out of, you know, I, I did, I kind of didn't want to work on them again. But they said, Mark, just stop. And then what I kind of do is I'll tell them, 
well, you just start working on it. I'm going to go get some water. Then I, once I hear the sanders going and everything, and I'm not doing it, I don't have to be responsible. You know, it's like when somebody else orders dessert and you can eat it, but you didn't order it. But I didn't order it, right? Right. So it was that kind of thing. And But once I broke through that, um, that kind of self-consciousness of, like, the show was finished and it wasn't. And then actually Johnny really finished here and the sculpture finished here. So what you see now is not what was in the studio. Now that was really probably, well, it was. Well, well, Cutting it close is what you're saying, but it was, but you know when it finished. Close. But you, did you know when it yeah. was finished? Yeah, I did know. And I knew that it wasn't fully, fully finished, but I was willing to let it go out like that. Mm -hmm. You know, because <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Don't say this in front of the people. <laughs> no, wait, between me between and you. Between me and you, yeah. <laughs> I would have let it go. <laughs> so that, and we, and I actually, I kind of tightened up the edges a little bit. And, and one of my assistants who gets really excited, like me, I always have to remind him, okay, this is not our studio. We have to just touch it up because oh. I'll get going. Yeah. And I noticed they did start, they started checking on me more. <laughs> you need anything? N some water? Because <laughs> I, you know, I started to like, oh, what? Mark, you want to go for lunch? <laughs> Are any of Mark's assistants here? Because also lovely people. Yes, wonderful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mark, can we talk for a second about your work with young people? Because um, I know this is very important to you. As a matter of fact, you know, yesterday, last night was your big opening, but before the Hoi Polloi got to see the show, you had young people in here, I think foster youth in here. Was the that day yesterday, before. the day before? Yeah. Okay. And, um, and I know you work a lot with art and practice and, um, and, and particularly focused on foster youth who are in that transitional age. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about why and what you do with them? And um, I think I'm, I like to work with people that are, for, for no volition of their own, it's like some um, have had to navigate in a, in a less than traditional way or have less of a net of a support system. Through no volition of their own, they're suddenly out of, out of the table and not sitting at the table. For no, so through no volition of their own, um, it's like someone done something silly and or, or ha now they have a record. Yeah. Now they can't get a, this one thing or something. And I think I've been very uh, interested in taking people um, and demanding that they sit at the adult table. There should never ever be an adult's table and a kid's table when it comes to policy or when it comes to art or when it comes to education. Mm -hmm. There should be this multiplicity of voices at that table and they don't, we don't have to be the same, mm -hmm. but we should both occupy the same a, a, a a chair. Mm -hmm. And so um, <clears throat> I, I do like to work with young people who are creative and maybe don't have access to the same level mm -hmm. that I had to navigate through or, or, to, or to try to create another roadmap and, and data and, 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 and try to help them figure it out. Because I think that if they can see it on a day-to-day -day basis, they can believe it. You have to be present. You can't phone it in. If you're, not, if you're gonna phone it in, don't do it. You really have to be present. So yes, I do. I wanted the art students to come before because I wanted to say that they had value. And this idea of having value. There's so many people that will tell you that you do not have value over and over and over and over again, but you have to tell yourself that you have value, right? You can't wait for somebody else to tell you that because honey, the line will go from here to the... No, it's true. So I never, and I, when I see that, and it, it, it touches me. And I always say the best, well, the best way to heal a scar is to do something for someone else. Yes. I, 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 yeah. I, I, I do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That yeah. like when I feel really ill, I need to be generous. Mm -hmm. I need to send a card. I need to send a package. I need to show up for somebody. I need to, like, that is something that really does heal. It's true. It, do, it, it really does. And, and I like, I, I like what we do. I like contemporary art. I like the ideas. I like the thinkers. I like the spaces. I love everything. That we, I just want to share it with more people. I just want more people to have access to it. But I don't want to change what we do. We can kind of change where we do it. We can do it in the post office, the library, the um, 
hair salon. I just, but, but I like what we do. I, I, love, I love these ideas. I love these talks. I love the people coming together. I love all this. Mm -hmm. So I do want to share it. I'm, I'm thinking that art and practice in the local, actually art and practice is almost on the, on the same block that my hair salon was that I grew up in. And I'm thinking, well, how would it have been if Little Mark, who made that film, could walk into art and practice just on his way to the wig shop yeah. to get some wig glue because my mom needs some wig glue mm -hmm. or some eyelash glue. Mm -hmm. I don't think they wear eyelash glue anymore. They got a whole nother thing. They have a whole nother, yeah. Um, <clears throat> how would that... It, it wouldn't have hurt anything. It just would have added something more. Mm -hmm. Th that's it. Just, I'm not asking, just, I want to be here too. So when I work with young people, I, I always keep that in mind. I always keep that in mind. And because I want to make them feel like they have value. I didn't always, people didn't always tell me that I had value, but I kind of did whisper to myself that I had value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whispered. <laughs> well, I'm, or, or between the teeth. Whatever. Well, I have value. <laughs> kind of whispery, whispery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes you have to, I was, I, actually, you know, I was talking to some of the students and I was saying that, you know, when you, you know, when you plant a seed, make sure you put that, that fence around it. Yeah. Until Protect it. Protect yourself. Until it grabs root. Mm -hmm. Right? Until it comes up and then we can all be under the sh shadow of it. But, you know. Just shh, when you grow in it. What are the pl so you so in Los Angeles? I know you work with art and practice. You did some work in Baltimore. Are there other places that you're? Yes, I'm working at the the border. There's kind of a border. I'm working at the law, uh, the U.S. Mexico. Mexico border. Yes, um, I, I work in I'm doing a pro I, I've done a, pro a long term project in in uh, Process Colectivo in a women's prison mm -hmm. in Italy. Look, these are not. I don't look for projects. I don't look for things. They find me. We find each other, and we know that we're going to, it's, it's a relationship. It's just something, and I don't ever, it's, it's very organic. Sometimes it comes out of a, 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 a show yeah. that I'm having, and then sometimes it's just something that someone tells me about, and I'm just interested in it, and I follow that curiosity. And then sometimes we get, I get excited, and I want to do something, and I run back and I tell my partner, he said, okay, well, Mark, let's just slow it down a little bit. <laughs> or he says, well, that's, that's, that sounds, yeah, let's do it, we can do it, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> my partner actually, we work with, we do, we work, we do art and practice together. Mm -hmm. He's the Alan DeCastro right there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you do a show like this, and you're putting the show together, and you, it, it, it's mounted, it opens, this room is full. And when you're walking through here, what is, it, what is it that gives you the sense of satisfaction? Beyond knowing that your work is complete, what do you want to be happening with people as they interact with the, with the work? Or do you just are agnostic? I put it up, y'all do you. Correct. The last one. <laughs> I'm like, I need to go back to the studio. <laughs> And figure out, I, I need to go, I, you, you know, I, was, uh, I have to build more runway. Yeah. I got to build more road to let the car go down. I just really want to just go back and, and, and make more work. Are you a workaholic? You know, I never thought about it. Um, I work a lot. Yeah. I really do like it. Mm -hmm. I, it's fun for me. Yeah. But is it, yeah, Alan, am I a workaholic? <laughs> oh, he's not. Alan, yes, of course, yes. Well, I guess I'm a workaholic. And that, that can be both a 1099 and a W-2 thing, because I, too, am a workaholic, which is crazy. But, you know, it is what it is. The need is there, and so it's got to be done. Yeah, I do like it. And I, I <laughs> my goodness, I always tell. I, I do. It's funny. You have a show, and then you sit down with the, your, your gallery, and you tell them all these things. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Don't you worry about that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. <laughs> and they're like, Mark is going to go back to the studio and do exactly what he wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> because you want to start working on the next thing. Yeah, I'm just curious about the last painting I finished for the show was that, Blackton. Mm -hmm. So I need to go back to the studio to, to start another painting to see where we're so going. So say something about... What, the kitchen? No, I was going to say the kitchen sink. Um, <clears throat> um, it's the last painting I made for the show, so I feel like it has a lot of everything in it. Mm -hmm. All the ideas condensed into one. It looks really ancient, ancient, ancient. And what that, I worked on it so long that it got, it feels like um, burnt, mm -hmm. like burnt. It's so many layers that what happens is the paper doesn't 
shine anymore. It absorbs into the canvas. That's a, you can always tell by the weight of my canvases how long I worked on them. So if they're really, so really layers. heavy, they're that means I struggled. Mm -hmm. Like struggle, struggle, struggle. That's a struggle back there. That's a struggle. I'm not happy to see that one. Um, I just want to see where it goes, where we are. I just want to see, I don't, I mean, you know, you're kind of, you're, 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 you're interesting and you'll, you, st you, you, you still have so much joy, but you I talk do. about, you, but you talk about things that are really, really troubling. H how, how do you keep that? Um, <clears throat> you know, I, um, I think that it's a habit, you know, um, we had a hard time as kids. I told you I lost my mom when I was very young. Um, and there's a lot about my childhood that was painful, but mostly what I remember are how we made ourselves laugh, like how we, you know, had, how I had a good time with my siblings. Uh, and some of it now I look back and it seems a little forced, <laughs> but it was, it was a habit to try to be joyful in the midst of, of, of really um, difficult times. And like you, I very much enjoy what I do. There's nothing else I would want to do except work on creating this world of you know of justice of racial equality of dignity for every person like that's the thing how what could be better than that i mean if i had talent you know but but what could be better than that so it feels um it doesn't feel like work to me it is exhausting but i won't lie and say that the last um and not say that the last seven or eight years you know have been difficult when you've i've been at this 30 years and you believe that you are slowly but surely rowing the boat in one direction and then, you know, it's almost like you, the terror in the closet, right? You know, that it, white supremacy arises again, you know, and reveals itself in its most naked, raw form. And you have to wonder about, you know, how, how deeply you planted the roots of this world that you wanted. My kids, you know, I made, I made sacrifices. I worked hard. And um, so you didn't wonder about time away from them and, you know, what was it all worth it? At the end of the day, you know, I'm always trying to make the world that I wanted for them. And so that has to be worth it. You know, you, you just keep, you just keep at it. And joy is like, I also feel like that's part of just like being black and figuring out how to stay sane and, um, and, and, and keeping life a little bit light. I always say you have to wear it a little bit lightly. You know, I don't walk around like I am a civil rights lord. You know, I don't, I don't feel that way. I could feel, do it very well. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I feel, I feel like a, like I'm just a person and that, you know, I love movies and I love theater and I love art and I love gossip and, um, you know <laughs> what I mean? And tabloids and, you know, I, I mean, I like silly stuff, you know, yeah. and I love sports. I'm like a crazy sport. So mm. there's just, I try to stay in the, in the world with the things that, that make me happy as well. That's all you can do. You can't get it too deep. And then you, but then you get it very deep. And then it gets very deep. <laughs> and the, yeah. And that, and, but you got to find the outlet for that. The outlet for that is the work. And the only time it's really frustrating is when it's almost like you were just talking about right at the beginning. What I'm asking people to do at this moment in this country, at least, is to grow up and, and decide that we can take it that we can take what we're being asked to do right now, which is to be a different kind of citizen, which is to confront hard things, which is to have hard conversations, which is to care about other people's children, which is to care about other people's neighborhoods, which is to stop hoarding your own privilege. I mean, there are all these things. And so the timidity around that project, that does kind of make me angry, right? The the because I do think that there's an infantilization that is very American, um, where we just don't want to do hard things, but we want to tell these fantasy stories about being a shining country on a hill, and I'm over it. I, I've said before, you know I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want I don't want people to come to me anymore after a beautiful lecture like this and say, just tell me what is racism? Like, I don't want to do that. If you're still at A, I'm not your girl, okay? You got to be around, I don't know, L maybe, something like that. You know, M, something. I just can't do it anymore, you know? And so I, that's the only thing that makes me impatient is when people want to drag you back to having the same conversation rather than allowing us to go forward. We know what we know. We know what we're seeing. You know what it is. Please stop playing. 
and, and let's just get serious about what we have to do as the people who came before us had to get serious or else we wouldn't be in this room looking like this if some people hadn't done some things even though they couldn't imagine right, what that world would look like. Um, even if we didn't linearly benefit from them, we did. And um, so anyway, that's, that's how I keep it, keep it moving. You know, it's, it's, it's still a joy. Mark, this was fantastic. I do want, um, <laughs> he's amazing. <laughs> He is absolutely amazing. And, no, but um, I, you know, it's, it's, it, it literally was, we, we created this like bridge between me and stood in the middle and just had this but great you're, But you're, you don't even know you're a civil rights activist. So you know, that's what, that's, I told you that's what I saw. So I feel like we're in the same work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter just whether in different you're in space. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether you're intentionally, you're doing it, it's happening. And if we're going to be saved, it's gonna to have to happen in multiple spaces. It's not gonna be up to some little group of people bringing cases and marching with a sign. It's you in, in whatever you do. And so when I, for me to be just, and even right now I feel my head swirling being surrounded by this work, it's a beautiful thing. And you're a beautiful thing. That's how we were able to create this bridge. <laughs> Thank you.